a beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim will be explaining, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, the Prophet uh, said, reported by Thoban radiallahu an, uh, that in Allah ta'ala zawali al arda faraaytu mashariqaha wa magharibaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rolled up or unfurled the earth for me. So the whole earth was in front of me. فَرَأَيْتُ مَشَارِقَهَا وَمَغَارِبَهَا And I could see the most eastern and the most western. The whole world, I could see it in front of me. And the, from the east to the west. And إِنَّ أُمَّتِي سَيَبْلُغُ مُلْكَهَا مَا زَوَالِي مِنْهَا And Allah is going to give my ummah, the dominion, over all that I saw from east to west. Now, hadith is going to go on. We're going to give a sharh bit by bit. First and foremost, obviously, the fact that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been blessed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to have this type of knowledge. We all understand and admit that our Prophet Sallallahu what does a Nabi mean? A Nabi is somebody who gives you news, Naba, that you don't know. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given whatever he chooses to give of the Ilm Al Ghaib. And the Prophet ﷺ himself told us this, that I don't know ilm al-ghayb except what Allah has given it to me. And this is one example of what the Prophet ﷺ has been given. He's been given predictions of the future. He's been given knowledge that no one can possibly know unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with this knowledge. So one of the things he predicted, because Nabi, somebody who predicts the future, he gives you a prediction. One of the things he predicted is that my ummah is going to control the dominions from the east to the west. Now, second point, subhanAllah, how precise. He didn't say from the north to the south. He said from the east to the west. And if you look at the expansion of the ummah, it was from the east to the west. It didn't go up north or down south all the way. It went eastern to western. And within 100 years, Islam was already in what is now China. And within 100 years, Islam had already conquered Andalus, which is the westernmost. That's the west, khalas. There was no land they knew beyond that. And a third point here, that our Prophet wasallam is giving us a prediction of a political or civilizational nature. And he's giving this at a time when the world is persecuting Islam and Muslims. So he is saying, don't worry. A time will come when you shall have dominion as far as the eye can see. You're going to control from the east to the west. And this shows us that one of the goals of the Sharia is stability in this earth. In this, uh, earth. There's a big controversy amongst the various you know, in interpretations and movements that should we even have some sense of political civilization? Or is our religion just ibadah and rituals and aqidah and that's it? And if you look at the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, there's no doubt there's an element of political stability. There's an element of giving us basharat or good news that Islamic civilization is going to be supreme. And this shows us that there's nothing wrong. In fact, it is a part and parcel of the Sharia. As in one hadith, when the people were being persecuted in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ said, Are you being hasty? Do you want immediate help? Fawallahi, I swear by Allah, a time will come when a lady will go with her shepherd, with her flock, with her sheep from Sana'a to Hadramaut, and she will fear none except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what exactly is he predicting? He is predicting stability of a land that is so massive. You're worried about Mecca. We're going to control to the very ends of this land, which is Yemen. So he's giving a prediction that is a civilizational prediction. That there's going to be strength in this world for the ummah. There's going to be peace and stability for the ummah. And this shows us again, this is the reality we want a place and a land. We want a civilization that has our values that's reflecting, you know, peace and stability. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it is of the goals of the Sharia. And uh, in another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, This matter, meaning the religion of Islam, it is going to go wherever the night and the day reaches. Everywhere in the world, there's going to be this matter, meaning Islam. And this is factually true. Every land on earth
has Muslims. Every city and every major city and civilization across the globe, there are Muslims there. So we learn, therefore, that it is human nature that you don't just... Yes, of course the primary goal is Jannah. Who can deny that? Of course the primary goal is the Ridha of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But don't we also want stability? Don't we also want political you know, uh, uh, um, ascendancy in this world? Of course we do. So that's a part of also being a Muslim. And that is why our Prophet is giving us good news while Islam is being persecuted. Yes, he also tells us, don't worry, there's Jannah. When Ammar and his mother uh, and father Yasir and Sumer were being tortured, at that stage, he's not telling them, oh, don't worry, there's going to be Medina. Who cares at that stage? At that stage, don't worry, your place is Jannah. That's our ultimate consolation. But there's also going to be a worldly consolation. There's also going to be a reality that don't worry, this land that you are being persecuted in, you're going to be dominant over it. This land that right now you don't feel safe, a time will come where there will be so much safety. A young lady will travel and there's not going to be any highway robbers, there's not going to be any kidnappings. And subhanAllah, this shows us that one of the main goals of any land is peace. One of the main goals of any civilization, of any political power, it is peace. Because that's how he said it. A lady is going to travel, nobody's going to uh, uh, harm that lady. So the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah Azza wa Jal showed this whole world to me. And I saw the east and the west. And Allah will give the dominion to my ummah, to all that he saw. And Allah has given me the two treasures, al-ahmara wal abiyada the red and the white. What does this mean, the two treasures, the red and the white? Our scholars say that this is an immediate reference to gold and silver. So red here, any gold is like reddish, and yellowish, right? And al-abiyad, silver. So there's the immediate reference to the ummah having lots of gold and silver. However, there's an indirect reference as well. And that is, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Roman Empire was the empire that was minting gold coins. And the Persian Empire was the empire minting silver, right? So the Roman civilization had the dinar, dinaros. And the Persian civilization had the dirham. And the rest of the world would have to employ their currencies to use gold and silver. So what the Prophet is saying, Allah has promised me the red and the white. Not only is it a reference that you'll have economic independence, but there's also a reference you're going to conquer these two civilizations. You're going to be in charge of this land. And that's exactly what happened because for the Arabs, the Roman civilization was Syria primarily. Right, because the Syrian land was immediately, that was the Roman civilization. And for the Arabs, of course, the Persian civilization completely conquered. The Roman civilization, half of it came to the Muslim Ummah. And the Persian civilization, all of it came. So the Prophet ﷺ is predicting not only political dominance, he's also predicting economic wealth and stability. And once again, this is a goal, not the primary goal. Nobody should say this. The primary goal is always Jannah and the pleasure of Allah. But don't we want political stability? Don't we want economic stability? Don't we want happiness in this world and the next? Shouldn't we as a civilization aim for a, a, a land and a place where we are secure, our faith is secure, our living is secure? So when Islam is being persecuted, when poverty is extreme. The Sahaba at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the default was extreme poverty. He's telling them, don't worry. A time will come when you're going to control the East and the West. A time will come. You will be given more gold and silver than you can count. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنِّي سَأَلْتُ رَبِّي لِأُمَّتِي Then I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for my ummah. I asked him in this version, which is the version of Thawban, he asked two things. And in another version of a similar hadith, um, the, uh, the version of uh, Subhanallah Ata'a bin Sa'ib He asked three things So it's the same hadith But in this Tawban one In Sahih Muslim It's two And then in the version of Abu Dawud It is three So I'll mention the, the two And then the three as well As for the version of Sahih Muslim uh, It says That I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Li ummati Number one Allah yuhlikaha bi sanatin amma That my ummah Not be destroyed by Any one famine or plague Okay So first request by the way, the fact 
The Prophet his du'as are primarily not for himself, for his ummah. We know this from this hadith and many other hadith. The primary du'as for our Prophet were for his ummah. He would be begging and crying Allah. He would be crying in tahajjud, praying for his ummah. He would be constantly worried about his ummah. Ya Rab, ummati, ummati. So many hadith about this. And here once again we have this, that I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for my ummah. And we all know that when Allah gave him one du'a, that will be completely answered, guaranteed. He saved that dua for his ummah. He didn't use it for himself. And that will be his shafa'at al ubma on the day of judgment. That he said that every prophet has been given one dua that Allah has said you will get it. And every prophet used that dua in this world. As for me, I have kept this promise from Allah kept this dua. I never used it in this dunya and I'm going to use it on the day of judgment for my ummah. That Allah shall forgive my entire ummah that testified la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's my dua. And that dua has been given that eventually every person who says the kalima shall be forgiven. So the first thing he asked that, oh Allah, let not my ummah be destroyed by one in a complete calamity, like one plague, one famine. I don't want my ummah to be gone like this. And so this is the first dua because civilizations at the time, it was well known when there's a drought or a famine, when there's a, 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 an infestation, when there's a plague that comes, we just lived through, you know, the, our coronavirus here. You know, alhamdulillah, we had some knowledge of medicine and whatnot, but you all know what happens when a plague comes or when a calamity comes. Generally speaking, it's possible for an entire civilization to be wiped out. So he said, oh Allah, I ask you that you don't uh, cause my ummah to be destroyed entirely by a, a famine or a plague. Number two, that wa Allah yusallit alayhim aduwan min siwa and fusihim fayastabih abaydatahum. And O oh Allah, let no enemy come and attack my ummah and yastabih abaydatahum. It will translate metaphorically as and eliminate them completely. I don't want an external enemy to come and eliminate us completely. Now, as I said, the hadith of Thawban has only two, but the, th the third version in Sunan Abi Dawood that the Prophet said that, And oh Allah, do not cause my ummah to internally fight. Do not cause my ummah to fight amongst itself. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala three things. Number one, don't cause my ummah to be destroyed entirely by a pestilence, a plague, a famine. Number two, don't cause an external enemy to come and eliminate the entirety of the ummah. And then number three, don't cause my ummah to fight amongst itself. So the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّ رَبِّي قَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ My Lord said, يَا مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِنِّي إِذَا قَضَيْتُ قَضَاءً فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُرَدُّ When I make a decision and decree, none can cancel it. None can uh, uh, get rid of it. And وَإِنِّي أُعْطِيْتُكَ لِأُمَّتِكَ And I've answered you, your request, for your ummah. Notice Allah is saying, you're requesting this for your ummah. I know it's not for you. So you're requesting it. أُعْطِيْتُكَ لِأُمَّتِكَ Your ata that you wanted for your ummah, I'm going to give it to you. Number one, لا أُسَلِّتَ عَلَيْهِمْ عَدُوًا مِنْ سِوَى أَنفُسِهِمْ فَيَسْتَبِيحَ بَيْضَتَهُمْ That, uh, sorry, لا أُهْلِكُمْ بِسَنَةٍ عَامَّةٍ I promise you, they're never going to be destroyed by one famine, one plague. It's never going to happen. Your entire ummah is not going to be destroyed. Yes, pockets, but not the whole ummah. Number two, that I also give you. They're not going to be destroyed by another enemy outside. However, and, uh, and this hadith also says, Even if the entire world gathers to destroy them, I've given you this. They shall not be destroyed. As an entirety, they're never going to be gone. And that has never happened despite so many, you know, uh, battles in the past and whatnot. Never has the ummah, even the Mongol invasion, people thought it is gone. But no, Allah has protected this ummah and it shall remain protected until the day of judgment. But then the, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, however, as for the internal issue, حَتَّى يَكُونَ بَعْضُهُمْ يُهْلِكُ بَعْضًا وَيَسْبِعَ بَعْضَهُمْ بَعْضًا There will be fighting internally. And your ummah is going to destroy other portions of the ummah. And your ummah will even take prisoners of war from your other parts of the ummah. And our Prophet wasallam said, إِذَا وُضِعَ السَّيْفُ فِي أُمَّتِي Once the sword is unsheathed within my ummah, 
it shall never be lifted up until the day of judgment. So this hadith tells us some bitter truth. And that is, Allah did not answer the third dua for wisdom known to him. And Allah said, that is going to happen. Your ummah is going to fight each other. Your ummah is going to harm itself. Externally, I protect you. And from natural disaster, I protect you. But within themselves, you will harm each other. And that is something you have to deal with. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted to us, for the first time when the sword is unsheathed, there will be perpetual fighting within the ummah until the day of judgment. And that sword was unsheathed in the time of Ali radiallahu an and the battle of Safin and the battle of Jamal. That was the first time the sword was unsheathed. The civil war took place. And ever since that time, we've always had to deal with internal issues. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also demonstrates that yes, our Prophet's maqam is very high, but just because he wants something, he does not get it. That's why he said, once I make a decree, there is no canceling it. And I've made a decree that indeed, you might get this, okay, I'll give you that. But this issue of internal fighting, I have made a decree. And this is the reality of Allah's decree. There must be a wisdom that we don't understand or know, and we trust in Allah's judgment. Final point, brothers and sisters, why is the process of telling us this? What is the wisdom of telling us this? The wisdom is that we have, first and foremost, a sense of optimism. The future is better for you. That's what he told the Sahaba when they're being persecuted. The future is brighter. You will have political stability. You will have economic stability. And then secondly, that to warn us, to be careful. Don't be deluded into thinking that there won't be any troubles and harms. And to give us that warning, the primary harm will be from within, not from without. And if you look at the ummah around us right now, subhanAllah, we have allowed so many internal issues to cause the ummah to be in the state that it is in. Even where there's external issues happening, frankly, without getting too explicit, it is because internal elements have allowed it to happen. It is because there are people amongst us that have allowed external issues to be taking place. Otherwise, we have enough of a clout and enough of wealth and enough of power that if we were to be united, no power on earth could stop us. But because we're internally divided, internally bickering, and because segments are allying with outside and external forces, then we see what we see. So it is a warning to us that we should try our best to find that unity, to not bicker amongst ourselves, because our internal downfall will be our primary downfall. And this is what happened with the collapse of the Khilaf and other issues that I've spoken about. Inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our hearts united. We strive for unity as much as we can in our own lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect ourselves and our families and to give us that sense of izzah and that sense of promise that we have been given in this hadith. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما